Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have a uh, um, Professor Satyajit Ghosh. Uh, he he is giving a, a lecture today, and uh, he is a senior professor at the School of Mechanical Engineering. at the Velour Institute of Technology and a visiting professor at the School of Earth and Environment University of Leeds um, UK and his earlier substantive um, appointments include um, research associateships at the Department of Applied Mathematics and uh, Theoretical Physics University of Cambridge and uh, in UK and uh, also at the manchester his research areas include aerosol cloud interaction in mixed domains analytical quantifications of received rain amounts and uh, cloud auto conversion and accretion processes non ideal aerosol signatures on cloud conversion processes and more recently he is working on uh, biometeorological applications over the built environment he received the editors award from royal meteorological society uk for um, encouraging young indians to engage with the meteorology he is an associate editor of journal of atmospheric science letters and is also a fellow of the royal meteorological society uh, professor ghosh will be talking about analytical formulations for quantifying the monsoon rain amounts with biometrological biometrological applications so let us welcome uh, professor ghosh it is our great pleasure uh, welcoming you for delivering this lecture thank you so much thank you professor ghosh please Minimize. Please make it. Ah, uh, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. yes. Sir. Yes. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm ever so grateful to the um, to IIT in Pune, not only for organizing the fantastic lecture series on uh, cloud physics, but also for the just concluded ICCP for the first time in India. so i shall be talking about uh, a lot about quantifying prediction quite quickly and what it means for the built environment and to set the scene i think um i'll i have a little surprise <laughs> there you go the sound of lashing monsoonal precipitations over the built environment and in in this case the built environment was the uttarayan complex in rabindranath tagore's shantiniketan so straight over to the outline so recently we experienced flooding and enormous deluge which kind of makes us believe that we have an unlimited supply of fresh water from the heavens but that's not so so the table on the left shows us that uh, the mass of fresh water that we receive from the atmosphere not only is minuscule but its residence time is also quite low if you compare it with the other sources of fresh water such as the greenland ice sheet the antarctic ice sheet and the ocean um so we are de dealing with something rather precious and if this precious commodity uh fosters the growth of civilization its retreat it being hushed away causes untold misery as you see in the picture on the right it's a drought like situation 
perhaps because of an raging El Nino, perhaps because of a failed monsoon. So a little bit about the Great Famine of 1877, where an under, underestimated official toll was over 5 million, pointing to the vagaries of the Indian monsoon. And going back to the records uh, from the reference given here, that year also coincided with one of the strongest El Ninos on record, which is picked up by the climate models. So um, this causes a lot of trauma in the lived experience. That drought year, 1877, the population of our country was only 200 million. And the projected population uh, by 2050 would be 1.64 billion. That's the year when 85% of Indians would be living in urban areas. Hence the urgency of finding meteorological interactions on the urban environment within the subcontinent. So more recently in 2016 to 2018, the Northeast monsoon was quite low um, to the extent that in June 2019, there was a day zero uh, when uh, Chennai city was completely bereft of water. So we find that this happens not just um, in the past, but it's a recurring theme even now. So what's happening now um, has not so much of an impact on the rather wealthy farmers, uh, but farmers who are not so wealthy have to thrive on small croplands. And uh, is this going to be the norm that you have intense precipitation on a certain year followed by drought subsequently? So the received precipitation amount is geographically variable and also tempora temporarily quite skewed. So naturally, scientists the world over have been working on um, what might be the impact of the vagaries of the monsoon on crop failures. Um, this is a recent piece of work that I had done with my colleagues at the University of Leeds who looked at a small cropland in South India, farmers who grew groundnut. And um, this is a geoengineering study where uh, it was found that with increase in global mean temperatures, the small farming community would be drastically affected. And some statistics about uh, the years when the monsoon failed over the last 15 years. So now we go back to uh, not so distant past uh, about uh, some modifications that were done recently on an existing structure. So this picture that you see is of the Kalanai Dam, which was built by uh, the Cholas 2000 years ago. So why I'm bringing this in is Tamil Nadu is the rice bowl of India. And um, the floodwaters of the Kaveri Basin had to be managed. And since we are talking about the built environment, I thought I should start with an iconic structure from the region where I am based. So this was to manage the floodwaters in the fertile Kaveri Delta and the timeline. It started in the first century AD and ended a century, uh, second century AD. And not much is known um, thereafter until the British arrived. And in 1839, Sir Arthur Cotton actually made some retrofitting. He enhanced the originally existed Kalanai Dam, much to the betterment of this um, ancient structure. And uh, then in the last century, gates were added. So uh, we did a lot of research on what would happen if intense precipitation were to fall on this arrangement, would it cause inundation and flooding to the detriment of the people or uh, the retrofitting that was done by the British, were they good enough? So that was the purpose of this study. 
Now, it's not just large scale structures that manage intense precipitation events over river banks, but the ancient Tamils also collected rainwater on much smaller scales through a system of areas or the, or the, or the tanks. So the point that I'm making is the ancient had an awareness how precious this commodity is, and they roughly knew uh, the times when it would rain and, and how best it could be managed. So intense precipitation, can they trigger dam failure? We know that earthquakes and also intense precipitation can actually damage um, dams. So uh, Dr. Tara Prabhakaran had indicated the purpose of this lecture was also about uh, giving general contexting um, as a part of uh, our uh, teaching and learning process. And so this is a project that was uh, dealing with the applications of uh, computational fluid dynamics. And this is an ongoing exercise and uh, various IITs and NITs and, and including VIT, we are starting. We are initiating international collaboration on computational flight fluid dynamics. And in particular, in, in our school, we have got a massive funding from the Erasmus Mundus to do these kinds of simulations. So I'm going to show an example which some of the BTEC final year semester mechanical engineering students did on the Kalanai Dam, which was subsequently published. So the main purpose is if you have intense flooding um, on the plane, uh, the dam arrangement should be able to slow down the velocity heads. So it, would, it was a very interesting exercise to compare what obtained 2000 years ago. Was that a better arrangement or the new arrangement initiated by Sir Arthur Cotton? So I'm going to play a simulation. And uh, so what, what we have done is we have scaled uh, the new arrangement and given it a velocity for intense precipitation, that velocity greater than 20 meters per second, that would be seen on the right. And then we, we have to see what is the arrangement doing for the particle simulation flows. So the red ones, 20 meters per second on the right, and then the arrangement that's up. So we can see that not only is the velocity coming down to um, quite significant lower levels at certain areas, the velocity is still Secondly, this arrangement of the turbulent kinetic energy uh, uh, on the spillway design, the, the regions of the most intense TKE is actually not touching the structure. So uh, in conclusion, we find that what Sir Arthur Cotton did was actually wonderful. It has saved the dam and it stood the test of time and the wrath of intense flooding year after year after year. Now from uh, that time to more recent times. So we've had extreme flooding this northeast monsoon season, and I had said that by 2050, almost all 85% of Indians will live, move into urban areas, which, which would have a high density uh, lived area experience. You can see encroachments of the Chennai and flood waters. And although it's relatively flat with the Bay of Bengal on the right, there are, you can see these patches of blue are the original areas, which are natural reservoirs to receive the precipitation. And with encroachment, all that is getting filled up and you get undesirable flooding. So this is the extent of the built up area from 2015 to 2020. And you can see a lots of yellows and reds on the coastline of Chennai. But what is very important is uh, North Chennai includes a lot of slum dwellers who live in shanty towns and uh, they live their living operating from shanty towns. And these are extremely vulnerable and prone to flooding and loss of livelihoods and lives. So these are the areas uh, we are concentrating. 
And uh, again, some statistics of certain areas of the built areas where we've had very intense precipitation. And you can see that the departure from the normal on some of these some of these areas uh, is extremely significant. So now coming back to the theme of analytical formulations. So on the right, I have used a picture from the IITM website. So they uh, here you see uh, clusters of cloud, separated clusters, much like what would obtain over a localized region of the over the Chennai city. And this, these are quite deep clusters with frozen tops. So you would have frozen hydrometeors, snow and ice and gravel and the rest of it. But below five kilometers, uh, it's, it's predominantly warm rain microphysics. And it's actually liquid warm rain that is uh, falling and flooding. And when you have um, an arrangement, a radar arrangement, you can actually pick up these clusters and it is over these clusters and over the warm rain part of the clusters that today I shall be showing about uh, some results on how we can analytically predict the onset time of precipitation. It's going to tell us at what duration it's going to rain over say Egmore or over uh, Tondiar Pet over Chennai. You can actually roughly know it through simple calculations what would be the most vulnerable part and for what duration you might expect intense precipitation without having to run expensive computer programs. And this, this pre-study can be used in screening and scoping operations in environmental impact assessments for town planners. So what is triggering the uh, onset of rain, a little bit of basics. So you'd have the initial stages, you would towards the cloud top because the liquid water is increasing adiabatically with height, larger droplets are more concentrated towards the cloud top. You have a process called as auto conversion. So as the name suggests, it's a conversion of similarity, similarly propertied drops are grouping together to convert themselves into something else, uh, i.e. rain. And then in midway between the cloud interiors and towards the, towards the bottom, you have the process of accretion. Accretion again, as the English suggests, that it's collection of smaller droplets by larger drizzle droplets and rain droplets. Um, before, I, and you can see pictures, you have an assortment of small droplets and some very large droplets. So these large droplets are collecting the long droplets and you have uh, triggered a self-sustaining system of producing more and more rain. Little bit about the sizes. At the smallest tens, we have these aerosol particles, um, which are of several kinds. And then these grow by a process of condensation. It's a slow process and Professor Andrea Flossman talked a lot about the diffusional uptakes and the applications of Kohler theory, where the, all the thermodynamics of this process of where, where in dry hygroscopic particles grow into cloud droplets. And these droplets are embe embedded into those cloud structures that you see, that you saw earlier, um, which are mediated by updrafts and downdrafts or eddies. Uh, you would you could expect large eddies uh, of the order of a few kilometers to intermediate sized eddies straight down to micro scale vortices, very small eddies of the order of a few millimeters. And then as they are sloshed around by these whirling eddies, they group together to form rain. Now the numbers um, so the first number on the left refers to uh, uh, the size in microns from very small sizes to intermediate. Size. And then the second number refers to the numbers per liter. And the third number refers to the velocity in centimeters per second. So the larger hydrometeors have very large velocities and they settle faster. 
And a complex computer model would have to resolve through all these three scales. And you could have a variety of models. You could have micro scale, parcel scale models, large eddy models. And currently, most of us are using the weather research and forecasting and then the IITMs and the I I IMDs global forecasting models. So I shall um, start with my first case study, which pertains to uh, the deluge in December 2015, where Chennai was completely inundated. So this is the synoptic picture. You can see bands of intense rain, but this is blues. So the whole idea was to compare these analytical formulations through a two-step process. First is standard WARF run, well-respected WARF run, weather research and forecasting analysis. And this is what uh, we've done. This is the model WARF run. You can see this three key attributes quite well captured. And then these were compared with observations, again, quite well captured. So the next obvious thing would be to do to see if the analytical formulations that, are, that I'm about to present are they comparing well with the WARF runs. So the cloud morphology for this case study, the panel on the left shows a deck of clouds organized into structures, a contiguous band with separated amounts of large and small amounts of cloud water. This is at the initial stages. And the panel on the right uh, refers to what obtains after about 20 minutes. And you can see the onset of rain, the red bands, you know, it's it's uh, that's warm rain that is formed. This is from our own WARF run for the case study that I'm talking about. The tops have frozen hydrometeors and concomitantly the rain amounts at the start are minuscule, but after 20 minutes, in a layer average sense, the rain amounts have increased. So when we plot the liquid water parts um, over time, we see that uh, there's a point of intersection that there's a massive depletion of cloud water amount and a massive increase of rainwater amounts, um, suggesting the ob obvious that the cloud water has got converted to rainwater by the combined process of autoconversion and accretion. So the starting point of the, this analytical formulation, of course, we have to revisit the classic Kessler formulation because we're dealing with um, warm rain microphysics. I had written a paper a long time ago with Professor Peter Jonas. And we, uh, so the first process is the Kessler's original formulation. Capital M is the rain mass and small m is the cloud mass and A is a threshold. You can see that there's a linear conversion of cloud water to rainwater in this very simple formulation with two adjustable parameters, an auto conversion rate and an auto conversion threshold, suggesting that you would not have cloud conversion to rain unless the threshold is attained. Generally, um, it's of the order of a few, uh, one grams per meters per second. Although quite simple, one of the drawbacks for this simplistic formulation is um, its assumption of a monodisperse vector. I remember uh, in the discussions in part of this series, uh, Dr. Prabhakaran had asked Dr. Govindarajan, in your sophisticated DNS simulations, are you are you assuming a monodisperse spectrum? <clears throat> and she said, no, um, we can relax it to a polydisperse spectrum with a sort of a very uh, thinly spread Gaussian bloom. So, uh, but actually real clouds have a variety of droplet sizes. So I thought that it would be better to work with a scheme that has measured cloud distribution properties. So for that, I invoked the Berry scheme, which has a quadratic dependence on the cloud water amount, but it has cloud spectral properties. Um, just as in the KPEX observations, you can get the number of droplets at the cloud base 
and the dispersion of the cloud base. Now, this procedure of analytical formulations have a very deep bearing on seeding implications. The first point that I wish to make is, you know, various institutes and certainly the IIT uh, have facilities to detect from the radar reflectivity, they can detect whether uh, a target cloud would could be possibly seeded to produce rain. So, so what is very important is that uh, you cannot create rain out of nothing. You need a certain threshold amount of water, liquid water for that to be nudged into producing larger droplets by an intervention mediated by an, uh, flares of releasing hygroscopic material. So now uh, seeding is a very costly experiment, hundreds of thousands of dollars for one seeding experiment. So I thought that with these back of the envelope analytical formulations that will follow, it, it is quite possible uh, to run these analytical formulations from radar pictures to see what might work and what mightn't work. So this is um, partly the work of my very clever PhD student, uh, Mr. Siddharth Gumbar. So how uh, the original Goshen Jonas paper is now being modified into much more sophisticated formulations. So a little bit about the notations. Um, the small r's uh, and the small v's refer to the radius and the velocities of the collected droplets. These are the small cloud droplets. And the large R and the large M refer to the collected droplets. N is the number concentration. And what you see in this schematic is un unless the two, the droplet pair come within an aerodynamically uh, possible regime of contact, um, they will not be able to coalesce. And clearly that would be mediated by the velocity and the area of cross section. And this is give, given by a Stokesian fall velocity for small cloud droplets. Therefore, you have the R square dependence. It goes as the square of the radius. So without approximating the rate of depletion of cloud water amount goes as M to the power four by three and not M. So that's one step. And then it's important to co compare with standard simulations. The K69 is Kessler's original, TC80 is Tripoli and Cotton, and B94 is uh, by Beheng. This this was by from a new paper by No et al. So what we are setting out to do in the Goomber and Ghosh formalism, we wish to retain the simplicity of the Kessler scheme and and put it in a form that can be transported easily into the WAF, which is perhaps the most widely used model uh, this day, and then predict the warm rain onset times. So how do we go about it? So when we relax the M dependence and do not make it linear, um, what happens is, uh, what we are suggesting is, Opti first find out the rate of change of depletion of rainwater amount with the cl uh, cloud water amount with the Berry scheme. You can see the quadratic curve M square dependence. Mind you, the Berry scheme uh, can be tweaked with observations, droplet dispersion of the cloud base and, and the spectral distribution. So what the Berry scheme will give us the time rate of change of cloud water amount quite realistically tweaked with observations. And in contrast, the original Kessler, you can see the abruptness of the threshold and then uh, linear decrease. So the optimization, you play around with the rate and the threshold to get a match that proxies the Berry scheme. Once you're able to do that with the right combination of your threshold and the rate, your scheme is optimized and you can use those values in the large scale model runs. Now we shall look at the implications of 
whether we are able to get analytical formulations on the onset times of precipitation. So, so much so for autoconversion, and now we have to add in the effects of accretion, that is the process wherein the smaller droplets are collected by the larger droplets, and this is mediated by a collection efficiency. Now, the value of that parameter can range from roughly values less than so about 0.1 to the maximum value of one, which is generally not attained. And dm by dt, again, you'd have more rain if you have more clouds, and so a proportionality between the product of the masses of the rain produced and the, and the clouds that has converted to produce the rain. <clears throat> this is the classic Berry and Reinhardt. You see the classic double hum structure. So from a mono dispersed distribu distribution, it's getting increasingly double humped. Even with small amounts of large droplets, you would get rapid conversion of cloud water to rainwater. And this is a stochastic collision equation, and R is the radius of the rain droplet. So after some, now, uh, how do you characterize the velocity of the large rain droplet? It, generally, it is assumed to be linearly proportional to the radius, whereas cloud droplets quadratic dependence on the radius. So VR, uh, a linear, uh, is the velocity of the rain droplets. Small VR is the velocity of the cloud droplets. So we just plug in the values of uh, the velocity dependence and we get an equation of that form. So just to <clears throat> contrast the old calculations with the new calculations, so for autoconversion, <clears throat> the standard Kessler, what I had done earlier with Peter Jonas, and now the new formulations, we're getting a quadratic dependence on cloud water amount. The accretion term is more complicated uh, because we are including the effects of the velocity of uh, the small cloud uh, cloud droplets. And then when we integrate, uh, we cast it in a form with constants. And let's, so after we integrate, we are able to get two forms of solutions, so depending on two conditions. T is the time over which uh, cloud water converts to rainwater. So, in one case, when B square is greater is the initial cloud water amount. Uh, so uh, for the present case of so the Chennai deluge gauge, which is continental, you have and a continental pollution number concentrations a few hundred per centimeter cubed and b square is greater than ac and you get that time and in contrast you might have a maritime case uh, where a tan inverse solution would work so now do these actually work to stop why are ours or Is the internet working? Let's see something. Huh? Hello? We are able to hear you. Okay. But the slides are gone. Is the slide visible now? Yes. Yes. Is it working, Sita? Yes. So is this work up? Uh, do these analytical formulations work? So we have the cloud water amount on the y-axis and the time. So we say that in nature, in a statistical sense, the E folding time, whether you talk of alpha decay, decay of elementary particles of cloud water to rainwater, a good measure of the conversion time would be the E folding time, the time scale over, over which cloud water amount is re reduced to one by E of its original value. With the new Gaussian Jonas formulation, for this case study, the E folding time is of the order of 17 minutes which compares very well with the 18 minutes that I had shown earlier. Whereas the Gaussian Jonas, which assumed a linear dependence of conversion, you'd get that time to be much larger. So we have 
it is safe to say that uh, by certain basic measurement techniques, analytical solutions will give the right onset times of precipitation and the right amounts. So now we apply that to the built environment over the Chennai slums. Clearly, poor points affected by intense precipitation are a foreknowledge of the most vulnerable parts, particularly over shanty towns, is very important. What you see in these figures, you have these uh, streams that would naturally carry uh, the streams of collected rainwater. And then you have certain pore points um, that, that have been clearly marked. So, and the black points are the heavily populated areas, the vulnerable areas, and the red points are the Chennai slums, the people who are very badly affected. So you can work out the discharge rates um, by knowing the area of cross sections and the rain rate and a runoff coefficient and you can use GIS systems which are available in all engineering institutes and various government agency. So, uh, so once we know the rain rates and the time of onset and the vulnerable areas, town planners have a very good handle to issue alerts uh, should the vulnerable population uh, were asked to move away from that area. Now, another part of this, we've seen that uh, we notice substantive change. Uh, we cannot hear you. Yeah, there's no sound. No sound. Sir, we cannot hear you. I think he is not able to hear us also. Yeah. Hello. We can't hear you. I think uh, yeah. connection is gone. I am calling him. Just one second. Okay. I think that is an internet issue. So Mahin, meanwhile, you see if uh, there are some uh, comments, questions on the, maybe you can. Yeah, there is a question, but he'll not be able to listen, madam. Yeah, maybe yeah. you can uh, post it here and uh, then when yeah. he comes back, maybe he'll be able to see it. Let me call him again. Yeah, he is back. I'm so sorry about this. Uh, it, you must tell me where I went off so that. Uh, yeah, you can. So is, is, was that heard, this page? Yeah, uh, I think you just started it. Uh, maybe please All start. Right. Yes. So the small. The dependence on cloud droplet velocity on the collision kernel is very important. 
And I, I shall refer to some work about one class of turbulence, turbulence mediated by microscale vortices. Microscale vortices are vortices of the order of a few millimeters in, in radius. And they are expected to be present in every form of cloud. So in the IPCC, we had we were shown a direct numeric, numerical simulations. And uh, although Jason Picardo did not uh, participate in the IPCC, but uh, his um, uh, physical review paper showed us an assortment of uh, different scales of uh, striated vortices. Uh, some of them were filamentous and narrow, like the microscale vortices, and some of them were not so narrow. So there was a spectrum on vert vertical radii. So here uh, we are simply talking of uh, stretch thin Rankine vortices with a prescribed circulation. So if you work through if you work through the maths, we are talking of these stretch vortices. Imagine you have a Rankine vortex that is that has a circulation and small cloud droplets are descending from the top. So as they are apprehending the rotation of this vortex, the velocity is speeding up. And that happens over a certain critical size range. The circulation gamma can be uh, written as a product of a velocity scale and a length scale. And if you relate it in terms of the energy to energy uh, parameter, you can see that the circulation is scaling just with the kinematic viscosity and not the turbulent kinetic energy of the cloud, suggesting that this is a much more universal phenomenon. So, uh, you know, other authors I've listed here, Pinsky and Kane and Raymond Shaw gave a very detailed account. Um, you can incorporate the effects of turbulence uh, on much larger scales by changing the kernels and uh, and the group in Germany uh, a long time ago that initiated wind tunnel studies on what would be the right collision efficiency. So. And then there was a nature paper by Falkovich, uh, which uses the de and hunt paper, which I have worked on as well. So here in this study, simply by invoking the rotation of the smaller scales of turbulence, the MSVs, we shall incorporate the velocity amplification effect. So as I said, the turning of these vortices is uh, speeding up the settling rates of the cloud droplets, but that settling rate is fading with large sizes. So that if they go beyond a certain size, they crash through the eddies and um, the eddy is not noticed anymore. The inertia is so much. So the Lagrangian integral time scale for these massive particles would be very different. So the droplets will not follow the flow and they'll crash through the eddies. Remember, the point to take is uh, the velocity of settling uh, fades with larger sizes, and that has been analytically written out by two adjustment parameters. I shall use two examples on stratocumulus and a cumulus cloud just to see if we inc incorporate this amplification effect. Are we getting better results? So that is the critical size range. We can see that over droplets, 10 microns, the percentage change is quite high. They're amplified substantially. And then as you increase in size, the amplification fades with radii. So what Siddharth and I were trying to do is, so you can see that this, the velocity of the cloud droplets has been recast with the velocity amplification effect. And we integrate these results to get the radii of the rain droplet with the amplification effect. And to see if you're on the right track, if we set the limits, if we remove turbulence, we get a collection time, which was derived by Baker as early as 1993. It depends on measurable cloud parameters liquid water amount and the collision efficiency and the velocity dependence through J. 
In contrast, if you include only the smallest scale turbulence, by the way, we have looked at the void fraction of the MSVs for the Chennai case study, and we find that they vary between 20 to 30 percent in a larger dissimulation. So we get a new collection time, uh, which is shorter than the original time, suggesting precipitation is initiated faster by invoking the presence of this turbulence. Now looking back uh, a little closer, so autoconversion and accretion and are producing a kind of a spray of rain droplets, which can be characterized by a source term. This is the source term of the rain droplets, which is a function of the autoconversion rate and the uh, starting radii. And if you work through the maths again, uh, we can find out the equilibrium distribution of the rain droplets uh, in a neat Gaussian like form in terms of error functions. And um, this is the distribution of the rain droplets with size. We find that when you include this velocity amplification effect, this is for a stratic cumulus case study. Uh, it agrees much better with observations than when this effect is not included. Now, we have seen that small scales processes contribute cumulatively uh, to quantify rain amounts, which can be predicted analytically. But uh, we'll have to forego the simplicity of analytical applications for many engineering applications because primarily I have to teach engineering students in VIT. So two very clever students, Bilton and Krishna Bilton is now in France. His BTEC thesis was the impact of cyclonic storms on fishermen's houses. And um, this is the case for cyclone Hudhud, which ravaged Andhra Pradesh. So Bilton, uh, experimented with five different types of roof forms from a dome to a shallow gable. Now, taking a cue from the Kalanai example, we, we looked at the British records for the suggested pitch of roofs. So again, about 150 years ago, they suggested uh, a steep pitch angle of about over 20 degrees, but we when we sort of downscaled WARF to uh, a more small scaled um, simulation that going to the building scale, uh, we, we could work out the areas of impaction and the most vulnerable points. Um, it, it suggests that a shallower pitch angle would work better, just as uh, Arthur Cotton retrofitted uh, by changing the spacing between the Venna uh, uh, Kalanai dam regulators. He had a different form for the regulators and managed the flood waters better. Here, this study is suggesting that by altering the pitch angle, uh, uh, you would get a, a better handle on the preservation of these houses. So this brings us to another region of the globe. Uh, this is the African continent. Um, part of the built environment where well, parts of Africa also receive uh, monsoon rains. There's a project called the AMA project uh, where some of the Leeds University people work. So now I'm moving uh, deeper into the realms of biometrology and, and I'll begin with the assessment of thermal comfort. Clearly uh, rains and clouds and cloud cover affect the humidity and the temperature, which is related to the levels of comfort. What you see here in, in engineering parlance, we, we are seeing a multi-layered building fabric. So it has cow dung and clay soil, much like the Indian houses. And in between you have air gaps. And this is retarding the transmittance of heat from the outside to the inside. And we model that to find out what temperature is obtained with an arrangement like this. So this is a prize winning photograph by Siddharth Mukherjee, who now works in ICTS. So 
Daylighting is a very important part, apart from the moisture and the temperature and the perception of comfort. This shows the contrast between the outside of the house, brightly lit, and, so, and then this is the con what obtains in the inside of the house. Now, a uh, slight digression from Africa back to South India. So recently we've heard lectures um, and discussions at the Glasgow summit and politicians and everyone is a stakeholder, including the ordinary people, about commitments to the lowering of the carbon footprint and energy savings. And uh, the Hindu organized a literary festival where the famous writer Amitabh Ghosh, uh, of course, he had published his famous book, The Great Derangement, um, and subsequently um, Jungle Nama, where there was a discussion about unless meteorology is brought into the context of everyday living, society is not going to change. What I show here is the famous Mamallapuram frieze. And I've said it's the universal voice of meteorology and artistry. You see two separated panels, um, and it has all the sentient beings of animals and the celestials and humans. And the artist's intention, the point of separation, is arranged by a cleft. And it was the artist's intention that it is viewed when it is raining on this freeze and as the monsoonal rains are gushing through that cleft the entire panel is vivified and it shines resplendently sort of animating every object in it so here you see that the connection between society and everyday living and engineering and art sort of all come together in that freeze which is sadly lacking uh, in the present day time. So at this point, um, I'm going to give you a short video presentation about bioclimatic architecture from Pondicherry, where I come from. And perhaps you do not know India's first uh, energy efficient building was built in this city as early as 1939. So when the French built Pondicherry, uh, the streets were parallelly around in sort of neatly scrabble-like arrangement of rectangles and, and squares, and the houses were fitted in al along the boulevards. But uh, the very sensitive French uh, uh, Japanese architect he sensed intuitively the direction of the flow of the land sea breeze from the coast of the Bay of Bengal and did this masterpiece of a building, uh, perhaps the first application of biometrology in the realms of architecture. I shall play that for a few minutes. Golconde, located in Pondicherry on the southeast coast of India, was designed by Antonin Raymond and George Nakashima in 1935 as a multi-story dormitory of Sri Aurobindo's ashram. This building has a world stature, both architecturally and in its bioclimatic response to a tropical, warm and humid climate. It has the reputation of being a well-maintained, comfortable building, although it has no mechanical cooling system. While gaining from the practical experience acquired in the vernacular buildings of Pondicherry, the architects have tried to translate them into materials that are offered by the modern world. The local climatic conditions were taken into consideration and the building was given the most logical shape dictated by the local conditions. It is an exposed 
reinforced concrete frame structure with traditional lime plaster on the brick walls. The fundamental principles of architecture, simplicity, economy, beauty, and closeness to nature were consciously and consistently observed. Golconde is truly timeless in its essence and a masterpiece of architecture. The roof is made of large and thin precast curved cement concrete elements creating a ventilated airspace over the third floor concrete slab. The ends of these precast curved elements on the north and south are sealed with perforated concrete slabs. The double roof was important because of the almost continual intense heat of the tropics. The convection of air keeps the top floor rooms almost as cool as the ones below. Both north and south facades are fully openable with louvers, which can be fully opened, half opened or closed by a series of simple state-of-the-art brass bars with notches to adjust the angles. Interestingly, all along the north facade, there is first the corridor which connects all the rooms. The decision to keep the corridor in the north side is an important one since Golconde is situated on 12 degree north latitude with summer sun penetrating on the north. This is how the rooms are kept cool all the year round, even in the hot weather. The louvers are easy to operate individually and allow for personal preferences. Rooms are separated from corridor by wooden sliding doors that allow air to circulate freely when open. The walls of the rooms are of brickwork covered with seashell lime plaster. There is no need to paint these walls and they retain their hygroscopic quality even after 85 years. The landscape gardens on the south and north have a sense of wideness due to the angle given to the building. Enclosed on all sides by high walls, they become peaceful cloisters where one can walk and relax. So we've seen that the building form is very important and the orientation and the creation of passive zones that would retard the ingress of heat and hot air inside the closed cloisters. And I have lived in Golconde for a week. There are no fans and you don't need a fan. Imagine the amount of energy savings that this building allows. So, so the, my last application is something that we did quite recently, and this refers to um, the Mandya district of Karnataka, where the Hindu reported the excavation of an ancient Jain settlement and some statistic about the years when the, mons the monsoons repeatedly failed over that area uh, in, in Karnataka. And uh, this is the story of Aratipura, which was recently published by us, again by mechanical engineering students, identical twins, Sagar and Samir, who are now at Carnegie Mellon, along with Siddharth and myself. So we looked at, uh, we wanted to answer the question, the arrangement that these ancient made, were they physiologically uh, comfortable? So, so there's a Jain temple, which is at the heart of the settlement, and those are the excavations. So when this was published, it received a lot of media attention internationally. And when Europe was ravaged by the summer heat, um, this, this journal paper, I mean, it was picked up by new scientists, was there on the cover page. And you know what the media is like in the West. A thousand year old Indian temple had an early form of air conditioning. So we are sort of inundated by tweets. 
Um, so what is it all about? What you see here is the ancients knew that the monsoons failed quite regularly. So they chose to settle over an area where there was a natural reservoir and where rainwater could trickle down and it would hold so much water that even if the monsoon failed for two years, they would not be water starved. And what is interesting is they had a granite skirting so that water losses were at the minimum. So we shall see how the effects of hydraulic air conditioning maintained cooled in the lived in areas, uh, just like the gold cone in more recent times. So, but the main challenge was we could not fly drones over the settlement because it's a protected area. And uh, so these very clever students, they liaised with computer science um, colleagues and they developed something called an histogram equalization technique, watershed algorithm. So, so uh, they kind of made a Google Earth image um, into a program that could give the exact dimensions of, a, of an area just by mathematically reconfiguring the sharp edges from the blurred ed edges. And so that way the exact dimension of the water reservoir was ascertained. So the comforts a little bit, so I have to allude to the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning. And um, these were first developed uh, by Fanger in 1972 on a seven point scale. So, and that is known as the PMV, the predicted mean vote. Suppose you have a group of people in a certain area and you vote on whether you're cold or warm or just right. And clearly, uh, the sense of comfort is based on both physiology and meteorological variables. The obvious meteorological variables um, are shown here and the physiological variables for a mammal with a four chambered heart. And uh, he gave an analytical formulation for the predicted mean vote. So the next bit is hardcore engineering. We had to get the thermal transmittivity of the composite layer of the walls. And that was done at the Bellor Institute of Technology. And you can see the air gaps and an ancient brick was brought to the lab and examined. And then we used a CFD code, which is NVMET. I'm sure most people know about it. This is routinely used for predictions of the urban heat ional effect across cities um, all over the world. So I shall explain the diagrams first. So what you see is the reservoir here, R, and then you have the dormitories, the D1 up to D8, where the Jain monks lived a thousand years ago. And T1 is the temple that I showed you, and there's another temple. And you see these flow vectors. This, a simulation was done for the month of April, a very hot month. and uh, we ensured that the winds were actually blowing over this water reservoir, promoting hydraulic air conditioning and kind of working on the dormitories. So being a CFD code, we could have a filled reservoir or an empty reservoir just to see uh, the effect of a water body in the vicinity. Is it bringing the temperature down? Now, this will have ramifications on you know, urban planning subsequently, and that will be my last slide. So we found that the PMVs in the dormitories, I mean, extended blue areas when you have the water reservoir, you know, all in the comfortable regime. And then if you have an empty reservoirs, that area shrinks. So this clearly proves that just by orienting your lived in area in the vicinity of a large water reservoir can give you th thermal comfort. So were the residents comfortable? Yes, they were from the PMVs. Now we want to find out 
what happens in the inside. The PMVs relates to comfort levels in the periphery and, and overall in the campus, but we looked at what is happening at the levels of the individual cells and we changed something called as the glazing ratio. As you saw in the gold cone video, just a simple arrangement of the loops actually uh, lets you adjust the, the window area to the wall area. So we gave in different glazing ratios for the cells and reworked the levels of thermal comfort with and without uh, the reservoir. Now, one comment uh, is that, uh, can we just transport Western um, codes to India? Uh, the, the short answer is no. I'll give an example. An Icelanding person, when he comes to Delhi, would find an air conditioner setting of 24 to be extremely uncomfortable. Whereas a Tamilian, when he goes to Delhi, uh, would find a 21 degree setting on the temperature to be quite Arctic-like condition. So the perception of comfort by human beings depend on where you come from. Fortunately, uh, we have now an India model for adaptive thermal comfort that combines the thermal experiences, what people are used to. So in this uh, paper at the International Journal of Biometrology, we worked with IMAC adaptive comforts, which are which relate to the Fanger model, but has a more tropical bandwidth vis-a-vis -vis, uh, humidity and temperature. So uh, we find that uh, for the expected glazing ratios, the presence of a reservoir makes all the 120 residents extremely comfortable. So relevance to smart city projects, and that's the end. The crucial point is, uh, the resident number to the built up area, that ratio, can that be extrapolated to a modern day settlement? We did that for a model day settlement in Bangalore. We had uh, two storied houses and there is an empty space of land there. And we did numerical simulations with that same ratio, the Aratipura ratio, if we extrapolate it to a modern day setting. And if you were to have a swimming pool exposed a sheet of water, we calculated the energy savings, uh, which is massive, and the reduction in the CO2 burden. So the scientists debating at the Glasgow summit would undoubtedly love all of this. So just to context what went on, we've seen that Precipitation is a very precious commodity that has to be conserved and it drives civilization and it affects livelihoods and vulnerability of the people. And by 2050, when most of us would be living in cities, we have to rethink how we manage energy resources and there is no escaping the reach of meteorology and the reach of meteorology can be an ameliorating experience if we plan better. And for institutes like the IITM and, and young Indian population of these qualified engineers and bringing in a societal context of policymakers and planners and artists and writers, if we all come together, possibly the places where we, where we live in would be a better place. I shall end with an inv invocatory chant that the Jain monks used um, as a prayer of forgiveness. <laughs> So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for the wonderful talk, uh, taking uh, cloud physics to the, uh, to the 
uh, applications and uh, historical uh, evidences showing the importance of weather and building environments, etc. Thank you so much. So let uh, um, Mahin, uh, Mahin please see the questions. Yeah. Mahin and Sudarshan are available. They will uh, address the questions. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, we have few questions from the audiences. Uh, first question is from Dr. Steve Dovey. He's, uh, yeah, he says that, uh, do you think the Kessler scheme should have dependence on the size distribution parameters so it can uh, be easily ad adapted to local conditions or observed conditions? Um, Steve, thank you very much for your deep question. I think I'll try and answer that. So you're asking um, how can we adapt the Kessler scheme um, to vary with the local conditions of uh, the distribution of cloud droplets. So the only way to do it, do it, you can't do it in in a straightforward, simple Kessler scheme because uh, it's just tied to the rate and the threshold. But if you optimize optimize it with a scheme such as the Berry scheme that I showed, that depends on the droplet distribution factor, dB, which is simply the ratio of the, the median droplet radius over the spread um, and the number concentration by tweaking the Ks and the As, you can uh, find out the region over which a tangent is covering most of the parabolic curve. So, so th that that can be recovered from observations locally, and then by optimizing, it it should be possible to use the Kessler uh, in 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 one of the schemes within large scale models. Yeah, uh, there is another question uh, from Dibba Darcy. Uh, what is dependency of particle size, and that is R on altitude? Is altitude a factor to account for when deciding an exact, exactly what height to seed? I think Dibbo Doshi, I mean, he, I know he works for Siemens and he's a hardcore mechanical engineer. So Dibbo Doshi's question is referring to uh, the altitude of the settlement. So what I could comment is, since the wind speed of the lower boundary layer varies logarithmically with height. Wind speed increases with altitude. So uh, it would carry more number of ground bone particles uh, from the lower boundary layer with, with the increasing wind speeds. So you would expect um, the distribution of particles would be Gaussian. Um, in 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 the vertical with a peak somewhere above the ground level depending on the height of the aerodynamic wave references so the short answer is yes you would get a concentration of particles at slightly higher altitudes but then thereafter it will meander back to lower levels yeah thank you um yeah, there is another question from Steve Dovey. Uh, can the uh, amplification effect on velocity affect the lifetime of the cloud during the later late stages of dissipation? Steve, just knowing you, such as you wind me up. I mean, this is something we are working upon. So. Uh, we are trying to prove that the effect of these microscale vortices, um, they kind of kickstart the process of autoconversion and accretion. Um, but then with greater invigoration, when, the, when, when uh, the cloud becomes very turbulent, you would have uh, a fading of this effect because of the, when the droplet grows uh, bigger, uh, the effect of these stretched eddies would, would not be that much. So uh, we would say that the MSVs are acting in tandem to initiate 
auto conversion, but I haven't got proven statistics to work on this. I'm working on this. Um, this is just uh, my hunch that that is going to happen. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, there are no more questions. There are a lot of compliments on your talk. Uh, Rivan Mishra, then Dhruv, then Diesel, uh, Nanda Jha, then everybody appreciating your talk. It is a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to IITM for doing this. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, we appreciate your uh, kindness to cover uh, so many areas that are uh, very relevant to uh, to talk about in this. Uh, uh, OK. All right, then. Hello. Bye -bye. Yeah. Yes. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, and uh, we we see you soon. All right. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Thank, thank you, you all so much at IITM. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.